way to bring in some um, elements of the fair tax that would create uh, some com consumption based elements in the tax code. But when I talk about tax, look, do you know what, I mean, we're the basket of capitalism, the basket of democracy here in the United States. We have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Up until just a little while ago, we had the second highest in Japan. We've actually exceeded Japan. We have the highest corporate tax code in the world. And people wonder why businesses may leave the United States. People wonder why when uh, a large company makes profit overseas in Ireland or in uh, you know, uh, Japan, why they keep those profits overseas and they don't bring them back to the United States. Because it's so expensive to bring that money back to the United States. They're better off leaving it over there in a lot of their opinions. So what we need to do is bring the corporate tax code down that makes our companies more competitive. I think 20 to 25% is a very logical position to be in. I think if we bring our corporate tax code down, it helps our businesses, it grows our economy, it employs more people. In terms of the personal income taxes, I think we need to uh, decrease them. I think we need to keep capital gains taxes low, because capital gains means people are putting money into the economy. I, I had a debate with somebody the other day, they said, you know, uh, these Republicans, they, 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 they hide away all their money. I said, what do you mean by that exactly? He said, well, you know, they put their money in, in mutual funds and, and hedge funds and stocks and things like that, and they, they just hide it away. And I said, well, when they put their money into a stock or they put their money into a mutual fund, which probably everybody in this room through their pension or through their 401k or through whatever, they're involved in a mutual fund. So when they put that money into a mutual fund, where does it go next? He said, well, it stays in, you know, in Wall Street. He said, no. I said, it goes to a mutual fund, and it goes out into businesses, it goes out into the economy, it grows the economy, it employs people, and they hope to get a return on investment. And so I think we need a tax bill that doesn't punish things like that. Do you have another question? Yeah, sort of, more follow-up. Oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, I mean, so I agree with you that Democrats don't have any longer, but I was sort of curious about the percentage of the, the line, when do you, what are the plus of the line? Why well, um, the specifics of it are, are, are pretty simple. I think that um, the Ryan plan aggressively addresses basically every entitlement program that we have, and it will not solve the trajectories that we're on overnight. But I think that you'll see over the course of probably I think it's either six or eight years, it basically flattens out the trajectory, and then the following either four, 12 or 14 years, it basically takes us back so that we're, we're not bleeding money anymore. I think that the benefits of the Ryan plan are, are, are pretty pretty obvious. They uh, aggressively uh, put Social Security into a situation where it'll actually be there for people that are retiring. It puts Medicare into a situation. It'll actually be there to fund the health care needs of, of the people that it's there for. Uh, the negatives of the Ryan Care are very political, to be frank. Um, you've seen with this administration already, and it's early in the campaign season, uh, you know, they don't have a record to run on. They're not going to run on the economy. They're not going to run on jobs. They're not going to run on ethics. They're not going to run on essentially anything. So what they're going to do is they're going to float a bunch of bright, shiny objects. And they're going to try to distract the voters with all these different things because the more we talk about jobs, the more we talk about the economy and how the Obama administration, their Democrat allies, have failed, failed the American people on those issues, uh, the more successful we're going to be. So, you know, they're going to talk about contraceptives and they're going to create a war on women, uh, which is humorous because, you know, I was doing the math the other day in you know, the 12th congressional district. I think we've got four or five out of the 12 county chairmen in the 12th congressional district for women. Um, I know uh, six of my 12 county coordinators are women. Um, I just did a, an event yesterday with Joanne Emerson, a very influential congresswoman in Washington, D.C., and at that event we unveiled our women's coalition for Plumber. Uh, but, you know, they're going to create a war on women. They're going to have these ads where we're dumping senior citizens over the cliff. They're going to talk about uh, everything that they can possibly talk about except for the stuff that will actually solve the problems we're facing. And so the negatives of the Ryan plan are exactly those things. They're going to try to use the Ryan plan to defeat Republicans across this country because they're going to turn it into uh, something that is not. 
It's, it's not something that's going to devastate the lives of senior citizens. It's not something that's going to be um, destructive to American families across the Gulf Congressional District, but they're going to try to portray it as that. And we need to make sure that we have people out there going, you know what, don't you want to solve the problems, or do you just want to talk about the problems? And I think Republicans are trying to solve the problems, and they need reinforcements in Washington, D.C. to make sure that gets done. <clears throat> Jason. Uh, it's on. I'll step you, know, you know, I uh, respect you a great deal if you're a principal conservative. But I'm going to have to disagree with you on that you think the Republican leadership of Congress is going to be a good uh, idol. This administration uh, assaults our society almost on a daily basis, suing Arizona for trying to. Thank you, for We're still in Florida for trying to have the tax rolls. I think they're the mushy middle. They're not being true leaders. They should be screaming every day about what's going on with this administration. And they're not. It's quiet. It should not be quiet. We need somebody up there like Scott Walker. Yeah. We should change things. And not be worried about the political fallout. We need somebody who cares about the country and not his political career. I want you to be like that. I, I appreciate that. And, um, yeah, I, I would say, too, um, and I don't know how many people saw the news today, but for when, when you control one-sixth of government, it's hard to do everything you'd like to do. And by no means am I making excuses for anybody, but uh, you know, I, I saw today that uh, Daryl Issa, the congressman from uh, Congress, uh, from California, who's been very aggressive on this attorney general of ours, who just never ceases to amaze me. As you alluded to, you know, he's suing the state of Florida because they're trying to uh, remove uh, dead people and folks that aren't even American citizens from voting rolls in Florida. Um, and most importantly, you know, this administration has done an interesting job of keeping Fast and Furious off the cover of every newspaper. I mean, literally what has occurred is the federal government said, let's give a bunch of uh, semi-automatic weapons to people that we know will give them to the drug cartels in Mexico. And let's hope that we can track these weapons and then catch people. And the only thing I'm aware of happening is, statistically, I mean, it's fact, hundreds of, of people in Mexico have been killed. We had at least one law enforcement agent in the United States who was killed by one of these weapons. And today, I was very proud to see Daryl Issa announce that they were going to file contempt charges, or take a vote on contempt charges uh, against the Attorney General of the United States. So, this administration does so much, you know, um, we could take all day going after all these things, but at the end of the day, a lot of those cases, we're going to be following those bright and shiny objects. And what we need to do is make sure that we're very focused on the, the pillars that I think will return a, a strong conservative majority to Washington. And that's talking about the economy, that's talking about taxes, that's talking about the job situation, and talking about the ethics of this administration. So um, by no means are they perfect. Um, there are things they've done I disagree with. Um, but... Uh, you know, I wouldn't give them an A plus, but I wouldn't give them an F either. They're fighting a lot of headwinds. They're fighting uh, uh, entrenched majorities in the Senate and the executive branch. And uh, you know, I think if we add more people like me to the Republican majority in the House that holds their feet to the you know, it's something I said all the time. Whether we win or lose, whether your candidate wins or lose, you got to continue to hold their feet to the fire. And if a Republican runs and says, "I'm going to fight to lower taxes," "I'm going to fight to hold the Republican leadership." Um, uh, to, to standards, if we're going to fight to, to preserve uh, the Second Amendment, if we're going to fight for our pro-life beliefs, whatever it may be, half of the collected, they darn well better do that. And so uh, I appreciate you being so, and I know you're super involved, Dan. Uh, I know there's people here that are super involved, but you know that's how we make sure that happens, by staying actively involved. I lost that Lieutenant Governor's race in 2010, and I didn't go home and cry. The next day I went to the office, and I stayed involved. You know, I've, been to, I've been to your meetings, I was at the Republican Central Committee meetings, because we have to stay involved, because I assure you the other side will always be involved.
So uh, you're right, the Republican majority is not perfect, but uh, the best way to solve that is by sending more good conservatives to Washington. I think I saw a question in the back. Jason, um, something that you can do when you get to Washington to um, make serving in the United States Armed Forces an honorable profession and um, to make the United States a country, once again, that's um, feared, respected, and honored by other countries throughout the world? Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate that. You know, th th there's a lot of good people in Washington that, that serve the armed forces, and um, you know, and I'll be very brief on this one. I'll just be blunt. That one of the most frustrating things I've seen in the last year, and this is a Republican and Democrat thing, is you took politicians from both sides of the aisle that could not reach a common sense agreement on the budget and on spending, uh, and because of that, who are they holding hostage? The men and women in the armed forces. You know. We're going to cut a half a trillion dollars from the United States military. We're going to take our military back. You know, if, if this budget goes through, we bear, the military bears the cost that we're supposed to bear. We'll have the smallest Navy since World War II. We'll have the smallest standing one. I take that back. We'll have the smallest Navy, I believe, since World War I. We'll have the smallest standing military since World War II. And we'll have the smallest strike fighter force that we've ever had in the history of the United States. And you've got the Russians that are aggressively doing things militarily. You've got the Chinese that are growing their military by leaps and bounds or getting ready to uh, uh, unleash some um, stealth fighter jets. They're, they're rolling out aircraft carriers. They're getting involved in you know, GPS systems that are very important. The Chinese are doing all these things. The Russians are funding Syria and Iran and, and doing all these things. And we're slashing our military. And we're slashing our military because a bunch of career politicians don't have the guts to make the decisions that have to be made. They're afraid to go back to their voters and say, you know what, I had to cut your pet project because I thought it was more important to give, you know, did you see the report a couple days ago where they're talking about cannibalizing military equipment, taking taking jets, and essentially, uh, I think it was the Department of the Navy maybe, I'd have to double check that, but they, they issued a report and talked about cannibalizing equipment. So, you know, if you've got 12 jets, you here's the procedure to cannibalize two of those jets to take equipment from them to keep 10 jets running. And this is the American military. I think one reason why we're so economically prosperous and why we're so safe as a society is because we have the strongest and the best military in the world. And I think that if we're going to preserve our economic prosperity, if we're going to preserve the safety of our people, we're going to make those tough decisions and we're going to make sure we have the greatest military in the world because the greatest military in the world present, prevents wars. That's what it's all about.